What is going on, guys? I'm just in a uh, content creation mode, I guess. And I got a cool, uh, a cool few questions to uh, start off. Please drop additional questions. I didn't realize it was like midnight when I said I was going to do this. So I'm not sure how long I will be doing this, but I figured this type of stuff's pretty fun. And I, I, you know, had my professional design team throw together a really nice slide for this. Uh, that is actually me right now in my Turkish cotton robe in my home office. So I figured it'd be best just to do a slide rather than you guys just watch me all sloppy in my robe. So like that's, I just, you know, I don't want to set the wrong tone with this. So <laughs> figured I would spare you guys that. So, uh, Hey, what's going on, Jordan? Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, man, I'm just stopped working. You know, I had my uh, I had my sleep schedule dialed in. I was getting up between like three thirty and five a.m. And uh, you know, I just uh, the weekends things get a little a little mixed up. I like to hang out with my kid and then spend as much time as I can working when he's not awake. So, and now I'm just now I'm just uh messing about as some might say but um yeah so i had a I had a couple questions uh before we even hey what's up mark good to see you. if you guys have any questions you can just drop them in here in the uh the facebook chat i'll see them but um starting off i had a cool question from i think it was from mike and um uh, it was about pbns you know he said what's the the cheapest way to get pbns right now and this, I always find this to be a really interesting subject because, you know, if you would have asked me that, I mean, a few years ago, it, it was so easy to scrape for your own PBNs. And you could put together really powerful networks just for the, you know, the cost of the registration and then whatever hosting infrastructure you wanted to put together. And with the introduction of all these scrapers, uh, a lot more domain vendors and PBN vendors came about because of the scrapers. Uh, some of them were pretty were pretty impressive. Uh, if you guys uh, know my my friend Nate had the uh, the domain reanimator and it was really powerful. So you know s stuff like that enabled you know a, a lot more people who wouldn't typically uh, go through you know a sophisticated scraping procedure to find expired domains. It enabled them to jump into it and enabled a lot of uh, service providers to say, hey, you know, we're going to scrape and build our own networks to sell and whatnot. So having said that, uh, my response to him initially was like, hey, because, you know, we drastically changed our PBN strategy and, um, you know, we've been using a lot more auction domains and there's auction domains and cost efficiency aren't really synonymous <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, we spent a ton, a ton of cash on auction domains, uh, lots and lots. And um, I'm actually getting a bunch of the auction domain vendors in the space together. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, getting auction domains and how to use them and what to look for if you want to get your own. And um, that'll be exciting. I hope to have that done in a, in a few weeks. But, you know, essentially the, the cost is no longer just about – you know, acquiring the domain because, you know, for instance, we sell links in order to mitigate the uh, infrastructural costs of, you know, just expired domains that we pick up. Um, um, auction domains, sorry, <laughs> moving a little slow here tonight. But, uh, you know, we, we sell links to kind of mitigate some of those costs. And I can tell you, you know, a lot of times people look at our uh, kind of like our expired, you know, domain, our, our network uh, or we sell links off expired domains and they're, they're not cheap. And, you know, a lot of people are like, what the, what the hell, you know, <laughs> why is, uh, you know, why are these prices like this? And it's not just, it's, it's no longer just the cost of the domain. It's, you know, there, there's so much more management and maintenance involved than there was a few years ago, in my opinion, to ensure you're getting the, the best bang for your buck. Like, you, you know, doing con consistent, well, I don't even know if I'd say consistent, but some type of ongoing content schedule, interlinking, um, you know, and it takes a team. You know, we have, uh, 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't sit and say we're a large uh, link supplier. I, I think there's a lot of a lot of link vendors out there that are quite a bit bigger, and you know we run a full team just for the expired domain and the network management aspect of things. So there's not really a cheap way anymore. I know um, Joe Asher, I guess that's how you say his his name, uh, is a dude in Australia. He does a lot of cool deals with people where if you build the domains out and uh, <laughs> what's going on, Scott? But he does some cool stuff where if you uh, register them, host them, and build them out and let him get access to them so he can get links, he'll actually give you the domains for free. And I'm not sure if he's still doing that, but, you know, we did that and got a bunch of domains. And, you know, I have to say, I think he does some due diligence as far as spam checking, but you definitely have to have a system in place. I want to just take his lists and register and build, mass register and mass build. Um, I tell you from experience, just make sure you double check. But he's a cool dude to work with, and he scrapes massive massive databases that databases just he has a massive database of expired domains that he scraped so you know that that's always an option um i mean you you can still grab something like domain reanimator or there's another tool i see get recommended a lot i can't even think of it maybe like domain ronin or something like that you can grab something like that and still scrape for your own the the issue is like if you go to run like a if you try to like scrape legal domains and actually, you know, make an attempt to get real like spam free legal sites, I, I mean, we I wouldn't even go for it. We we buy those type of sites at auction at this point. Um, so yeah, just the whole scraping expired domains space has become so overly saturated with all these easy to access tools. So that's something to consider. Uh, I definitely I, we do vendors for the most part. Um, at this point, you know, doing my own scraping doesn't even make sense. Um, so I, I would suggest, you know, if you were going to do anything at scale, or even if you had a budget in mind and said, "Listen, I want to build, I want to build a hundred a hundred PBN law domain over the next few months," you know, here's the type of budget. I'll buy them all from you. You know, I just, can you work out a deal? You're going to find a lot of these vendors will work with you. And th that's probably the best way to go about it. The, um, just the hassle involved, even, even doing auctions, the hassle involved to uh, kind of quality check the domains and stuff is it's pretty insane. And uh, we actually started building a tool to automate that, something we could use in-house just because, I mean, we spent, tons and tons of money on auction domains and you know granted the the vendors we worked with are awesome but we figure even if they're making a you know a 20 to 30 percent margin you know when we spend 50 or 60 thousand dollars in a month you know us kind of eliminating some of that markup can make a big difference over the span of, you know, 12, 24 months or whatever. What's going on, Michael? Yeah, automation. So the biggest thing I found, and maybe since Mike's here, and I know he does a lot with auction domains, he can chime in, but the biggest thing I found was there's a, I want 700% margins. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem, Michael. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to help. It's just, there's a lot to it. But uh, the problem we found with any type of tool for auction domain acquisition was I want a tool that essentially aggregates all of the auctions into a dashboard, and then I want the pop proper filters in place to be able to search by niche, by different metrics. I want the way back, you know, I want the archive uh, feature built in to where I can look at the domain and I, I can, you know, it pretty much pulls in the... Uh, the, the historic setups of the sites from the uh, Wayback Machine. And just for icing on the cake, I want to be able to bid on the domains right inside of my dashboard via uh, an API back to the auction site. So that's a, that's a, that was essentially the, uh, the goal of the tool long term. Um, right now we have, a, we have a decent chunk of it done. 
Um, admittedly, we haven't been using it much just because we spent so much on auction domains that we're kind of, you know, we still have a few sites to build and then the ongoing maintenance of that. So we didn't want to get too crazy. Mike, I'm not sure if you know of a tool that quite does that. Um, I'm going to assume maybe not. I think, uh, I, th I forget what the, the developer said, but it was something to do with, uh, I, I guess, all of the all of the APIs from the registers. It seemed like it was just going to be a bunch of work, and, you know, we built a bunch of the platform out so we can pretty much take spreadsheets of the auction domains. No, it wasn't a uh, – it wasn't – that's not the point of Jensen, Michael. But um, it was just something else. We called it Beastly Domains, something else we were playing with, just internal. And uh, basically now we can take spreadsheets of domains that we grab from like uh, – damn it. I forget where we even grab them. But we, we can upload this. <laughs> that's terrible, right? But we can upload that spreadsheet into the system and we can pull the uh, archive information in and then, you know, different metrics, and we can kind of have some type of filtering. So we'll, we'll get there one of these days, but, you know, it, it is what it is. But, uh, yeah, guys, anyone just tuned in, if you have any questions or you want to chat about anything specifically, you can drop them in here, and I'll be happy to uh, help you out. I just I had a few questions from the post I made, so I wanted to address those getting started but we can talk about whatever you guys want if you just want to talk about the uh that handsome sucker in the slide we can do that um you know i, I just wanted you guys to have the visual that that is me right now in my turkish cotton robe in my home office just kind of uh hanging out with the lct crew tonight but um yeah we can we can chat about whatever you guys want i know it's a little bit late i should probably do this earlier during the week but I was a bit wired up and just did a cool video in the digital trafficker group about uh, setting up the foundations for like affiliate sites, how we do the keyword research and um, set up like the content plan and whatnot. Ha, <laughs> Jared, Kylo, Mark, never. I'm not nearly emo enough to be like Kylo. Just... I mean, just off topic, guys. Can we agree that Kylo Ren from the from the Star Wars movies is like a brat? Am I the only one that thinks that? There's enough live viewers on here to give me some feedback about this. That was a low blow. I guarantee it, Jared. But um, I definitely thought that when I watched the first Star Wars. I'm like, man, this kid just like he gets mad and like punches things and like hits things with his lightsaber. I'm like. He's like a teenager throwing a tantrum, but I don't know. I mean, I'm just a little too old school, and he just he wasn't as menacing as Darth Vader, in my opinion. But ah, excuse me. Another question we have is about a uh, client acquisition. Since everyone's being a bit shy, we can rotate right into that one. Um, I, there was there was kind of like a two part. Uh, I noticed one gentleman said, you know, that I probably don't deal with, uh, oh man, <laughs> do you prefer shoulder press in front of your neck or behind? Dude, definitely in front. You can actually go over to my personal f Facebook page and you can see how I prefer my shoulder presses in a nice interactive video where I'm shoulder pressing. Yeah, that whole behind the neck stuff, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, like, I'm, I don't even have the, I don't even have the, the mobility to put something behind my neck like that. But I mean, I, I, I think if you want to press any type of respectable weight overhead, you better go ahead and, you know, do it in front of your neck. Jared told me behind the neck helps hit your biceps. <laughs> Dude, I who does bicep exercises? What kind of rep ranges do you do your shoulder presses in? Oh, I always try to go for the five by five. Grant, I haven't lifted in a minute, so uh, I always go for the five by five. But 
it depends. It really just depends um, how I'm feeling. Sometimes I I get away with a three by three. It depends on the weight too. Uh, sometimes I'll go and I'll go a little bit lighter. So I might do a five by five at like one eighty five, um, and then I'll actually drop weight down to maybe like one thirty five. And I'll do sets of like eight to ten, and I'll throw a little push press in. It just it gives me a little bit of a, a little bit of cardio in that higher rep range. And you know, being a fat boy, it's something that I, you know, I need to get that heart rate up when I can. So, uh, just I mean, I'm going completely cool with this turning into a, an overhead press conversation if that's the route we're gonna go. Um. Dude, behind the neck is key. I, I don't know, man. I don't like it. I feel like that's an injury waiting to happen. And I can definitely, like for me personally, I, I can summon a lot more explosive strength when it's in front, resting on the, the top of my chest even. Um, oh, just hit my finger. Biomechanically behind the neck is tricky. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know anything about biomechanics and all that riffraff. I'm just, for me... Like, you know, I'm, I just try to be fat, sexy, and strong. That's all I can do, guys. That's all I can do. But, <laughs> oh, man. But um, who the hell does bicep exercises besides Nate? Oh, man. <laughs> FSS, baby. Hashtag FSS, fat, sexy, and strong. But um, I had a gentleman, you know, that hit me up and said about, you know, because you do – um, you know, be, because you build like b the, a bigger agency and stuff that I don't do a lot of small clients. And that wasn't necessarily true. And there's a lot of people that'll sit in these groups or on their blog or in their course, they sold you and they'll tell you, listen, I only work with one niche and only charge five or 10,000 per month. And at the end of the day, that sounds good, right? I mean, it definitely sounds good and you can get there. Uh, but I can tell you, I mean, like I closed some big deals and like five and 10 and $15,000 a month clients don't just roll through the door. Um, anyone that tells you that do that they do, I mean, I'd like to see their business model. Um, I know there's a bunch of like, quote unquote, like I am gurus who do stuff like that. And at the end of the day, they're selling stuff to people like you and I, and they're five and 10 and $15,000 like coaching programs. Um, I mean, you can call it a client, sure. At the end of the day, they're they're you know giving you money and you're selling something. I don't have anything against coaching, by the way, right? Um, I'm actually thinking about doing some of them. I'm thinking about I hate consulting, but I was thinking about doing a thing where people actually come out to my office, like belly to belly, and uh, you know we'll whiteboard your business, we'll we'll work together on some stuff. But you know that that stuff's all fine and dandy, but I'd never I want to charge someone any amount of money and then go and flip it in a group and be like, Hey, I just landed X amount of clients and for this much. And, you know, at the end of the day, I post in a group that, you know, I'm, I'm at least a little bit liked and known and I know so it's my group, but a couple of you guys probably still like me. So, you know, using metrics, like, like I could easily inflate quote unquote client type metrics that way. At the end of the day, if you're selling any type of business owner, like, the first zero to 5,000 per month, like freaking close clients. Like I don't care what niche they're in. Make sure you're providing uh, an ethical service. Make sure you know what the hell you're doing. But close clients, make that money, you know? And the same thing from like five to 10,000. And, you know, lower price clients can definitely be a pain in the ass, guys. There's no doubt about it. But, you, you know, what, what people don't want to talk about is so, so are the ones that give you a bunch of money. People that don't give you money can be pains, you know, it's, it, it, it's just, you're always going to have, you know, good clients, bad clients, cheap clients, affluent clients. At the end of the day, I think until you get to a, a, a place where your revenue uh, can sustain your lifestyle, it can take care of you or your family, or if you want to, you know, do the digital nomad and travel and make some cash, like, you need to do what you can to get to that revenue level. And once you get to a certain revenue level, and this is what I did, I did, um, so I, I started doing some niche stuff based on referral really early on, but, you know, I didn't brand myself as a, a niche specific 
uh, marketer. Oh, Howard, dude, that's a really good point. I'll, I'll expand on that in a second, but I agree with you. Howard said it's easier to fire a $500 client than a $5,000 client, and that's especially true as well. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just rotate back to that in a second, but – Oh, did I lose my? Did I lose my? Oh, my, oh no! But I didn't have like I didn't identify as a niche specific marketer. You know, I wasn't saying, "Oh, if you're not in this specific industry, I'm not interested in working with you." Right. So, basically, I, I you know I grew my general marketing arm of the business. You know, you I can always sound like cool in corporate and be like, "It was my general division." I mean, at the time, I was I was trying to make a bunch of money. I was trying to make a million bucks, right? So I was taking, you know, I, I was I was kind of building the infrastructure as I go, and that's why I'm really big on teaching guys stuff about systems and processes because it, I didn't use that stuff growing, and I hit a ton of bottlenecks, and it probably pushed my hairline back a few unnecessary inches at a, you know, in my mid twenties, and I try to help you guys avoid that stuff, but you know, once I I got to a certain level in my general you know, my, my general agency, I said, man, I'd really like to, you know, brand this arm or this group of clients under a niche specific marketing brand. And that's something I'm still building to this day. And I fired a lot of general clients, uh, an irresponsible amount actually to focus on a software project and YOLO, right? Hashtag YOLO as kids say these days. But I, I, I think at the end of the day, don't focus on, hey, I don't want that $500 or $1,000 a month client. I want to try to go big because at the end of the day, your first goal should be able to create a, a sustainable flow of revenue to take care of you, your family, your general wants and needs, right? And um, that, that just to circle back to what Howard said, I completely agree with uh, it's easier to fire a $500 client than a $5,000. Also keep this in mind. If you have, um, just use a simple number like, 50,000 a month in revenue, right? Um, and you have five $10,000 a month clients, or you have, you know, 10 $5,000 a month clients, okay? A lot of people, or, or you have one $50,000 a month client. And, you know, there's a lot of people that'll come in, and I see it in these groups all the time, in a bunch of these bigger groups, and they'll say, yeah, I'll take the, the one client because I can – give them all my attention. It's less hassle. And the whole, the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, man, if for any reason ever that client fires you, your business is gone. Your business, the value of your business is shit. Let's just be serious because no investor is going to look at your business and say, Hey, this entire business relies on one client. Like you, you, your business does not have value. You have a, a very lucrative job at that point, and unfortunately, that job can go away at any time. So it's something to consider. And at the same time, with the five ten thousand dollar per month clients, you know, in the grand scheme of things, some of you guys may sit there and be like, "Damn, I wouldn't even care if I did lose one client. Cause I'd still be making forty. But once you get to that level where you are making fifty or a hundred grand. Your business, the infrastructure of your business relies on that amount of money. Your savings you're putting back, how your lifestyle has changed. Everything changes and, and you know, in the most in most cases, I mean, I know you have people doing this like minimalistic living and stuff, and that's all fine and dandy. I know the more money I make, the, the more my <laughs> lifestyle changed, and, and that's normal, you know. It's, it's normal for that to happen, and you don't necessarily have to be wasteful. You know, but the more money I make, the more other projects I invest in, you know, the more I want to expand, the more I want to reinvest and aggressively grow, you know, that business or a different business. And, you know, when you lose, you know, essentially, you know, $10,000 off of your 50, I mean, that can be pretty impactful, right? Or if you would lose two clients, I mean, it happens. I know anyone listening to this with a client business, there's months where it's like, damn, I lost like two clients and, or you know, you, you can hit those downward uh, those downward spirals and you lose two of your clients and it's $20,000 a month. That's really impactful. So, you know, that's always an argument against the, the big client deal. So, yeah, just, just to clarify, you know, I, I don't suggest uh, – I don't necessarily suggest just targeting that – that huge, uh, that huge payday right off the bat. If you are going home on that, I would buy Chet Holmes' book, um, Ultimate Sales Machine. That's what it is. 
Uh, he was a freaking monster. I think he ended up closing, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure he closed like 40 out of the top, out of the Fortune 500 companies in his heyday. He has some really cool acquisition strategies that even if you don't want to close Fortune 500s, uh, it's really good uh, methods using the uh, the top 100, your dream 100 lists and stuff. And anytime I talk to anyone about, about acquisition, I have a t- we have a ton of acquisition training in LPB. By the way, any LPB members listening, we're having a huge revamp this week. A uh, ton of new videos launching this week. Uh, lots of really, really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah, anyway. But we have a bunch of client acquisition videos in there, and that's all great. Um, yeah, Howard. Yeah, I knew I knew if you were still here, that'd be uh that'd be cool. Yeah, I was gonna do a standalone agency course. And it's basically, you know, it's just my journey of building, you know, my my agency that did I mean, last year I did about three and a half million dollars in revenue. And it's my journey of, you know, building systems. And, and now we're actually looking at, we're looking at doing a sale of the one agency and it's exciting. And, you know, I wanted to try to compile some information about how you guys can build scalable systems and, and, and kind of, it's all systems and process based, but I don't personally think it's boring. It's not like a lot of SOP and systems training. I, I, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just a geek. I thought it was super exciting, but I was going to do like a standalone thing. And I'm sitting like, man, it's been a while since I put anything in LVP. So I just threw the whole course in there. So the first, I think, like 20 videos of that's dropping. We have like five or ten new client acquisition videos dropping. Uh, we have the, an updated maps course dropping. LPB is going to get an entire phase. It's on a new platform, so you guys will get that information. Um, LPB is getting just a massive facelift, literally and figuratively. But uh, – Damn, I lost my train of thought on that one. Yeah, I, at least some people got happy about that. Uh, but I, oh yeah, so I mean, you can find specific examples of um, like client acquisition tactics, cold email, cold calling, Facebook ads, PPC, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, you you can find that stuff in LPB. You can find a lot of conversation about it anywhere, right? There's just a lot of content out there about client acquisition. But if I could give anyone like just a solid high-level client acquisition strategy, grab Chet Holmes' Ultimate Sales Machine book. Build a Dream 100 where it doesn't matter if you're going after $1,000 a month clients or $100,000 a month clients. It's arbitrary at this point. You build a Dream 100 list that you know you can have a conversation with that you can best serve. Your services are going to deliver them an ROI, and then build an omni uh, an omni channel marketing uh, marketing strategy to go after them. And that's basically um, I, I hate when words become like buzzwords, but you know, essentially, omni channel marketing simply like you're using a bunch of different platforms or acquisition strategies rolled into like one big lead generation funnel. So I might send them a piece of lumpy mail and I have some calls to actions. I might push them to a case study. Of course, there's a CTA where they can just get on the phone and book an appointment to speak to a, a consultant or a sales representative, whatever whatever a nomenclature you want to use to, uh, um, you know, for your sales guy for the sales process. And, you know, it, it goes it goes right along the, the sales philosophy that we need six to 12 touch points in order to close someone. And... Um, you'll find people that talk about the, the one phone call sale. I know, I think Grant Cardone's big on that and, um, you'll definitely listen. If you're a good sales guy, you can definitely close on, you know, in one call for me, uh, I've done a freakish amount of sales. It's one, it's definitely, a it's definitely a core competency of mine. I'm damn good at selling stuff, but at the end of the day, like, I don't want to get you on the phone and on the first date, I don't want to close you. Like I don't, I don't necessarily want your money on that first phone call. It's different if you're a, a hot referral or a, a hot lead, a hot referral. Sorry, if you're like a hot lead from a, it's a really great referral, a great reference. You know, one of my clients has been talking to you about me for the last six months, and it's like, man, he showed me what you do. I, I've seen the results. I'm ready to get started. Then it's a little bit different. You get a little more aggressive with saying, hey let's talk price and let's slide that credit card out. Right. But on a typical lead you generate, you might 
like I don't necessarily think the best strategy is just to jump into the sale because because realistically they're going to have the most buyer's remorse out of anyone you close out of someone that you have rapport built with and they've had some type of interaction with your brand five or ten times right they're going to be a lot more comfortable with the sale and you know at the same time they're going to have the highest refund rate they're going to i don't know it's just not my my cup of tea and i'm I'm definitely not going to sit and uh I'm definitely not going to sit and like bash Grant Cardone's sales system, right? I mean, I would hope on a on his bad day he could outsell me on my best day, right? And he most likely can. It's just not my type of system. And if that is your type of system, then use it. You know, if you have success with that that type of sale, then you know I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to use that system. But for the average Joe, you know, I think it's it's I think it's special to have just a a multi-touch, you know, sales system in place as opposed to trying on the first call. And that's where um, a lot of people aren't comfortable with sales either. And until you really get established, you might have to do a lot of your own sales calls. And that's another, you know, it's another circumstance in which omni-channel marketing is going to really help you out because by the time they get on the phone, it's going to be a very warm situation. Like I said, they're going to have experienced some type of touch point with your brand multiple times you know, at that point, they're calling and setting an appointment with you. It's just they're a lot more qualified, right? So if, you know, that's just always my advice in general. The um, the actual lead generation components, the lumpy mail, the cold email, driving traffic, retargeting, um, stuff like that, uh, you can plug and play with that stuff. You can test which systems you love best. At the end of the day, I think having a really solid uh, product to sell or service to sell, really have that stuff laid out, and um, you, you know, and, and having you know some type of consistent marketing strategy built out of a bunch of different channels, a bunch of touch points, something just set in stone. I think that's going to help you a lot more than you know learning a very specific lead gen strategy and going forth with it. So. It was my extremely long-winded explanation for that. Um, hey, what's going on, man? Chet Holmes is a great recommendation. Thank you. Yes, he is. He's a beast. I mean, I, I recommend him often. Um, Keith, where can I find out more about LPB? We actually have a killer lifetime LPB deal coming. I just wait. I want it. I want to give me any money right now. Wait for the better deal where you get all the cool stuff in the new platform. Should be this coming week. Um, thank you, though. I appreciate that you even have an interest. Um, this was really wasn't that <laughs> wasn't the intention here is to sell you guys anything. Um, but now that you're here for a one-time fee of no, I'm kidding. Howard, you mentioned bottlenecks in your earlier stages. Were a similar place where systems are becoming super necessary? Could you elaborate on what some of those bottlenecks were and how you worked through them? Absolutely. So. I don't want to. I mean, I could. We could sit and talk about this for hours. You know, I could. I could sit on here all night and talk about processes and scaling an agency and the different bottlenecks. Before I do anything, I'm gonna take a sip of water here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I think one of the biggest. Okay. One of the biggest ones, and I, I discussed this. I, I know you're, uh, I know you're an LPB, so you'll be able to check this out on a more granular level here this week. But um, one of the biggest things, and I, I see so many other people make the same mistake, is and when we made the mistake as well, to where we, in, in an attempt to, in an attempt to make more money, we would. Uh, you know, SEO was always the core competency, but especially as we started working with these certain niches who, you know, they just needed more marketing services, we kind of jumped out the window and we would offer, we would like customize the package too much, right? So instead of just saying, listen, we're going to rank your site for, you know, this cluster of keywords, this this topical, you know, cluster of, of keywords, and it's going to be this cost, and here's the expectations, et cetera, et cetera. We would go and say, okay, well, we're also going to, you know, and this this is just kind of an example. I mean, this was years ago that we had the most struggle with this. But we'd say, hey, 
you know, we'll, um, we'll have one of, you know, we'll have a company we work with, take a look and audit your PPC and we'll make sure your, you know, we'll make sure we try to give good analytical reporting on your Yelp ads you're running and everything else. And we'll add content to your site on this type of schedule and, you know, stuff like that. And that might not have been the best example in the world, but if you're not, if it's not your core competency, then I think it's a huge mistake to offer it. Yeah. Hashtag guilty. And it is, it's tough to turn the money down, especially in it. It's not saying you can't provide a good service there, but if you don't have a scalable system to add content to their site, to get it, you know, to get the content created, have an editor look over it, um, get it uploaded, you know, and you have someone that can upload it that's familiar with a, you know, a plethora of different CMSs. So, you know, they're not going to have to call you anytime they run into something that isn't WordPress, right? Um, There's just so many, I mean, we're just rambling here, but there's so many tiny little bottlenecks. Like what happens if they're on Joomla or what happens if it's a static HTML or like so many freaking, freaking small businesses, they're on like some type of stupid CMS that, you know, might be custom to the, the niche website company that bought their web page. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Anyone that's on should know like, and they have all of like the template content, templated content on there. It's the same across, like they have like an, a resource section and stuff. Um, I and mean, they're the same across all of their clients. It's like a giant duplicate content footprint, just all this stuff. And you know, it's those little things where it's like, Hey, we're having trouble posting this article. And it's like, damn, it's little things like that that start to add up. Um, or if you don't have a great resource to do the PPC audits, you know, for instance, any PPC work I ever took, I white labeled right through clicks geek. Uh, I like Ed and Rob. Um, they're, they're my friends. They're my real life friends. They actually came and hung out with me in real life. So we, we, uh, <laughs> we ascended past the, uh, the internet acquaintances and became, uh, IRL friends IRL in real life. Yeah. So, um, anyway, th- those are, those are the type of things that can really screw um, like a mom and pop size agency up is having like throwing a ton of custom stuff in there. Uh, those little extras are how I pull through a lot of our sales and we do a good job, but they definitely gum things up. Uh, yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, hundred percent agree. It's, it can help with the sale, right? Because the more, the more value or the more they think they're going to get out of you or the more you can, you know, the more of their pain points you can solve, it definitely helps close the sale. Um, as far as standing out from other people, I have, a, <laughs> I mean, I have, an, I have a bit of an unfair advantage because, you know, I definitely leverage the fact that I own like local client takeover and stuff. And although they obviously probably never heard of the brand, it's like, you know, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, helping other marketers with stuff. So, and it plays, it does, it plays really well into positioning closing clients because they're like, wow, that's awesome. If he's helping other people do this stuff, then, you know, he has to know what he's talking about, right? The whole like professor positioning comes into play. And um, that helps a lot, stuff like that. Anything you have like that, I mean, you have, you guys have to consider stuff like certifications. A lot of times we might laugh at them in our uh... – ah, thanks, Martin. Good to see you, dude. Uh, so, like, we might laugh at a certification, but you showing a client you're, like, Google certified, you guys have to understand they don't have the same type of market sophistication that the – that the people in this group are going to have most of the time. So stuff like that can help. Niching down helps in that case. Uh, if you have a, a case studies, oh my God, case studies do so much, so much, so much, so much. And this is why I always encourage people just starting out in their agency to do like start lead gen sites and rank and rent sites because one, it allows you to test a lot of what you're learning and create like a repeatable, scalable process to get achieve rankings and increase traffic and you know plus you don't have to worry about you, you know if you've never ranked a site you know I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of not taking someone's money to rank a site um, because there's guys 
like for instance, I rank a ton of sites, and it's still uh, it, I can still run into challenging situations. So if you've never ranked a site and you've never had to you know pivot on a campaign and try some new shit or you know just just get wild, <laughs> get wild. You know if you've never had to just really like wow like I have to really analyze this and we have to try uh you know we have to pull out our our notebook of uh, coup de gras techniques to really knock this out of the park. You know, if you never, if you've never done that, then it's not really fair to take someone's money. So I always encourage people to start their own properties that they can in, invest time and money in and they can kind of see how they're doing. But once that, once they rank that, once, you know, you're going to have access to all the analytics, the leads generated, that makes for a great case study to show a client um, I mean, it goes back to the concept of people that used to like rank videos for the client's brand name or for long tail stuff. I know people used to rank sites for long tail stuff. Not my style. I know a lot of people have done it, but there's there's a ton of ways to kind of stand out and position yourself as you know a, a, a good a good uh, a good solution for their their uh, marketing or digital market SEO, whatever you're selling. Um, case studies probably rock the hardest. To be honest, um, we're actually restructuring our entire retargeting campaign to be uh, case study and testimonial centric. And if you guys check out the uh, the new group, I'll probably talk about it in there because it's not a local site; it's a a, a national e-commerce site we're doing it with. And um, so I'm probably going to put it in the Digital Traffickers Facebook group. I uh, just did a cool live training in there tonight, but. Um, but yeah, reviews, lots of reviews, testimonials, case studies. Uh, the new group's called uh, Digital Traffickers. Um, obviously, I'm here at uh, 1 a.m. doing Q&A and LCT, so I'm obviously not slacking on uh, anything LCT related. It's just I want to do some other content, and you know, it's not really like I said. I'm, I'm not sure how many people in here want to see a, like a retargeting campaign that's case study and testimonial centric. So I'm going to put it in a group that isn't so compartmentalized to like, you know, local content. So yeah, check me out in the new group. Uh, warm referrals are the best. What do you use for referral generation? Good question. So a lot of times for referrals, what we do is we create a plan right off the bat. And this allows us to almost, I mean, I mean, they're referrals at the end of the day, but you quote unquote call them like JVs where I can create a compensation plan. Absolutely. Everyone can, everyone can join the group. Absolutely. Digital traffickers, uh, send a request. I'll accept you guys after this Q and A is over before I head to bed. Um, there's nothing, it's not a sales phone. There's nothing for sale. I just, I want to create some other content that isn't so local centric. And I've been meaning to create a platform to do that for a while. So I'm going to do like live videos in there and different stuff like that. But um, yeah, I actually create like a referral compensation plan for web design companies, PPC companies, stuff like that. And uh, you can do the same type of concept with just regular clients where if they refer you, works really well if you have like a, if if you set up your new clients like into like a contractual obligation, so you're there's a little bit more security that they're not going to pay for one month and bounce on you, but um, it can it works really well where you can say hey you know for every for every client you refer me that signs a six month contract we're going to give you a month of free work or depending what you sell I mean it works well in that case if you're selling thousand dollar a month SEO or fifteen hundred dollar a month SEO and they're bringing you thousand dollar fifteen hundred dollar a month clients but uh. I really like that strategy because business owners a lot of times are going to be, you know, networking with other business owners and it's, uh, it's really solid. And especially, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to every agency is, uh, there's two things you need ASAP. You need a lawyer. We have a business lawyer on retainer. Like we, <laughs> we, I can call him anytime. Um, you know, he, he's on, he's on the books. He's, I mean, he doesn't work for us, but you know, his firm is on retainer. He's retained. We get concierge type service and it's incredible. So, you know, there's a lawyer and you also need a CPA because they're, you know, the little, uh, the whole tax thing and whatnot. And, um, if you do a bang up job for them, a lot of times you can trade services at least to an extent. Um, you know, as you grow, 
to high six and seven figures per year, I highly suggest just putting the business attorney on pay on a retainer. We use them for all kinds of stuff all the time. Like you'd be just be surprised and you're more likely to do things by the books. In that case, there's so often where you see like, for instance, if you want to sell your business one day and you just download like a contract off of Google, a generic contract, and you have 50 clients all on this generic contract and they're all, you know, 1500 2000 a month, you're doing like good numbers. Um, and then the investor has their attorneys look at it and the contracts are just like null and void in the case of uh, like the, their return, their legal team don't, the, you know, they don't think the contracts will hold up in case of a sale. Like you're going to wish you had a lawyer <laughs> that would have drafted up your initial, you know, that would have done those initial contract drafts. So it's little things like that that you have to consider. I highly suggest getting a lawyer and a CPA. A lot of times you can trade initial services to an extent, and at the same time, you do a bang up job for them. They can be incredible, incredible referral sources because business lawyers are going to work with other businesses, and uh, your CPA obviously works with other businesses as well. And you give them some type of incentive and just take real good care of them. Uh, those are both very authoritative figures to business owners too. You know, you're in, you know, shooting the shit with a business attorney, and you say, hey, you know, we're really trying to get aggressive with growth. And they're like, hey, our marketing company grew us X, you know, X by X. And it's like, wow, that means a lot coming from an attorney. Uh, what an expensive resource for legal contracts do you have? Again, I, I'd, I'd always go with an actual attorney, but if you use stuff like LegalZoom, I mean, that, that stuff will hold you over. I just think once you do get to a point where you're making decent revenue, spend a little bit of money and have an attorney to check out your contracts and your just have an attorney fine tooth comb you. Make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and, and again, it's just good to be by the book. In the case where you do want to like, you know, really get your uh, really get the value of your agency done and you know potentially sell or. Uh, maybe you want to grow. Maybe you want. Maybe you want to get an investor, and the investor, you know, instead of investing in a a business that's worth three or four million because of how inconsistent everything is, it's not. It's not worth that much now. So, but legal zoom can definitely hold you over. But I, I would definitely go uh, the legit route. Do you have strategic alliances you have built up? If so, what do you look for and get in front of them? Absolutely. So, um, one of my biggest sources for business ever was a uh, a dental marketing consultant and still work with him to this day he still pushes business to us and you know at the end of the day it, i added a lot of value we started off butting heads uh i guess he viewed me as a threat he was you know it is what it is but uh, i realized he would make a uh a better ally than enemy. Oh, excuse me, than enemy. It's getting late. <laughs> he would make a better ally than enemy. So, excuse me. I um, I figured it would be best to you know start to help him, see how I could help him improve things, and um, yeah, it, it turned into a. It, it turned into a very lucrative relationship and we just give him a percentage of all the sales he brings on board in a recurring fashion. And I make a lot more money because of him and <laughs> vice versa. So those things can work really, really well. That's for people that have been in this group for three years that I'm a broken record with that. I'll forever swear by that being the most, uh, like the biggest growth hack you could ever implement. You can make tons and tons of cash. You can make someone else a bunch of money and, uh, it's good. It's all good. Uh, I'm heading in that situation right now. Thanks. Absolutely, man. It's. I'm telling you, if you set it up right, you're going to make a lot of money doing that, and you're going to do a lot less work. You know, going after marketing consultants or web design companies or you know paid traffic specialists and stuff like that. You know, in, you can make your dream 100 and close one of them, and they can give you 100 clients over the span of five or six years as opposed to how many people you'd have to reach out to and get rejected, right, in order to get that the same 100 clients. And then you have to figure the, the rate of attrition. I mean, you're still going to have attrition no matter where the clients come from, but, you know, he's doing all the customer care. He's just handling everything, you know, he or she. So, yeah, I definitely, definitely push people in that direction.
Um, do you do any business outside of North America? Um, you know, I was going to do some stuff in Australia really, really aggressively, and it just didn't work out. I couldn't find the right people in Australia to work with. I had a ton of really bad experiences with them. And uh, no, all my companies are uh, are, are U.S.-based. I mean, we have an office in Iloilo City, Philippines. Um, you know, we do some really cool stuff there for the community, but we don't do any, you know, we don't do any business that, like, faces the Philippines. We don't sell products or services to Filipino companies or Filipino individuals. So I'd have to go with a new... How often do you use webinars for customer acquisition? Uh, I'm definitely not the guy to talk to about that one. I suck at webinars. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I like to use webinars just to give free training because they've gotten such a bad rap from people just using them as sales tools. Um, so many webbies start out with, like, fluff. And then a bunch of guys talking about how awesome the other guys on the webby are. And then they then they like build hype up towards something they're going to sell. And then they talk about how awesome they are again. And then they sell. And then they while you're getting ready to buy, they talk about how awesome they are again. And how awesome you'll be for buying. So I wanted to try to remove some of the negative like stigma that but but I mean I'm just like I'm just out here trying to be the Robin Hood of SEO. <laughs> but no, I it is you know, I'm I'm not uh I'm not big on webinars for customer acquisition. That's definitely a good question for uh for Brian Willie. I know he does a lot more with Webbies and any let me try to think. Yeah, any money we made from webbies was for me like like an lct where i'd be like yeah your product's cool you can you know i'll promote you <laughs> and i go i'm like hey what's up guys here's these guys and i just bounce because i'm not i'm not great with doing webby sales um i am doing the webby for our software that's coming so i have that all scripted out and a lot of it recorded so i am gonna I'm going to do that, but it actually isn't to sell the software. The Webby's the giveaway free training. So I'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. But it's the front end of the funnel, so hopefully it goes well. Uh, how do you see the future of SEO in South America? Do you have any clients out there? I do not, but I helped the friend rank some sites in uh, Colombia and Medellin and stuff a long, long time ago. And I did notice it was, like, really easy. We were using, like, automated tools direct to the, excuse me, direct to the money site. And it was ranking them, and they were sticking. Haven't checked them in a long time. But uh, as far as, the, I mean, the future of SEO in general is, I mean, who knows, right? Uh, you're from Columbia? Very cool, man. Medellin looks beautiful. I've never visited, but it looks gorgeous. Um yeah, you know, the future of SEO in general is like a toss-up, right? Because you see you see the rush Google has. You know, they're trying to monetize the service-based the service -based queries now where they're selling the leads. And, um, you know, that's that's smart. A lot of people hate them for that, but that's really smart. I, I, got, I got an argument with a guy from the group before I ever even made this group. His name's Chris Trainer, Amazing guy, by the way. Amazing, intelligent, brilliant dude. Really cool guy. We got in an argument because I told him in a group one day, I said, you're crazy. I said, this whole thing's going to be monetized one day. I said, if I owned Google, you guys would be paying right now. And, and that's just the truth because they could use a lot of their same quality, you know, quality scoring algorithms and just have people pay for the spots. But I guess the, you know, I guess the powers that be won't let them do that because of, you know, monopolization and whatnot. But you're going to see them do more and more to monetize their search engine. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, it's their search engine. You know, the us having the opportunity to monetize it is incredible, but it's not our right, you know, and we're, they're going to do more and more to, uh, you know, to, to steer us towards monetization. And now you have uh, Alexa and other sound devices make me nervous. Yeah. I mean, 
I think I think uh, speech to text search and speech speech search whatever voice search. Um, it's definitely another piece of the puzzle, but I mean, in general, there's there's a ton of things, there's a ton of ways people are going to access content that is different, and as as search evolve, as search evolves, and um, you know, people evolve and how they want to consume content. Look at like YouTube, for instance. I mean, it, it went from. I mean, you can go not so far back in time to where video was. No one took video serious. And, um, you know, then as, as things progress, I mean, YouTube's just monstrous. And, you know, there's so many different ways to enjoy video content now to where I mean, people are freaking streaming video games and people playing board games. And there's communities being built around these video displays and I, I mean I understand that's not local search right I mean there's it's not local but we have to understand how search is going to continue to evolve as businesses look for more ways to reach people in inexpensive ways and you know just with with the increase in social media and video and stuff we've seen viral marketing become such a huge key component even on a local level to where you know, for instance, if I have a if I have a restaurant, right? And I, I grew up in the restaurant business, so I always um it's a double edged sword. Like I know all the shortcomings, but it's still like there's it's like a nostalgic thing where I'd love to you know open a restaurant. Uh, and uh, I never owned one before. I say again, but it was a, it was a family. You know, my my mom owned it. I'd love to open one again. And if I did, if I had one right now, like. Especially if you look at like SEO for restaurants, I mean, it's a completely different dynamic than SEO for dentists just because how people are finding restaurants. It's, uh, you know, just the, the increased importance in reviews across the board, any industry, right? There's these things like the, the internet, the people that are using the internet are going to continuously become more sophisticated and more evol evolved with how they search and how they select businesses or products. But, you know, if I owned a restaurant right now, I mean, I could do some crazy shit where we had eating contests once a month and I'd post it on Facebook or I could make crazy dishes and post them on Facebook and I could reach so many people in my area without spending a dime just based on the virality of these videos showcasing crazy foods or, you know, just these gin ginormous dishes, right? <laughs> Gi yeah, I said ginormous, by the way. You know, just these ginormous dishes of food for these eating contests. And, you know, there's so much you can do in those type of businesses to bring in customers that, you know, you don't have to pay for traffic if you're just a little bit savvy. So, you know, it's something it's something to consider. Like, pe people and businesses are going to constantly evolve. So to just say what the future of SEO will be, I mean, we can, we can count on Google to try to, you know, monetize their – their um, search engine as much as possible. And at the same time, you know, we're, we're just going to have to understand that, you know, right now we have the technology to track things on a more granular level. We have the ability to get eyeballs onto things for dirt cheap. We even have Facebook ads and Google network and these other mobile networks and retargeting and, and just, you know, free content you put out that gets shares. It's, it's impressive, man. So, I mean, the future of SEOs, I, I, I always say let's stick to the present. Let's get it while the getting's good. And I've told people that forever. When we were ranking sites in 14 days on the first page, seven days using safe links and the ugliest blog networks you'd ever want to see, you know, I made a ton of money doing that. So if I would have sat on my hands and thought, man, I wonder if this stuff will work in the future, you know, that I wouldn't have made nearly as much money. And granted, when you're doing client work, you need to be a lot more sustainable than that. But you know, just just food for thought. Uh, hey, what's going on, Ken? Good to see you, brother. Uh, local SEO helps with Siri searches, absolutely. And there's there's a lot of ways to there's a lot of ways to to influence that. You know, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, how people are asking the questions and how. Um, you know, the search bots translate your page from code into, you know, what the hell it's really about. And based on that, it's going to serve 
the result for that query the best it can. So, you know, but it's I, I think it'll be exciting to see how voice search continues to, you know, impact uh, just just SEO in general. Have you used Google Sites to help rank sites? Absolutely, Martin. It's uh, it's something we do for our clients, our personal sites. Uh, it's, it's something we sell on Web20 Ranker. Um, I love Google Sites. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with them. Um, re- really cool stuff. It's, it's neat how you can embed all the other Google properties into them, and you can really make some... Uh, some like Google link wheels and I don't want to scare you with a link wheel nomenclature, but you know, you can create like a really nice interlinked interlinked Google platform thing. Wow guys, it's 115. I'm starting to get burnt. <laughs> Traffic equalizer made me 5k a month with that sense. Nice. How long ago was this, Nicholas? How long ago were you making a 5k a month with traffic equal equalizer? Was it a long time ago? Martin says, I love link wheels. Absolutely, buddy. Google link wheels. Oh, Google link wheels. It's the way to go. Excuse me. Get a little bit of hydration. All right, guys. Oh, damn. I just smacked that windscreen right off my mic again. All right, guys. We've been on over an hour. I am getting... Uh, I am getting tired, <laughs> as you can tell. I'm starting to get a little silly here. So um, I'll have to do these at a better time in the future. And, um, yeah, I appreciate everyone that showed up. And hopefully I got most of your questions. I know there was a lot of stuff going on here. So I'm joining Digital Traffickers. Awesome, guys. Long time ago, I'd say eight years. Yeah, that's awesome though, man. But hey, I mean, if you would have sat and and thought about it too much, I mean, how much money would you have lost if you would have thought, hey, you know, this doesn't seem like it's uh, sustainable. It's all, it's always nice to make that little bit of side cash, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Join digital trackers. Anyone that wants to, it's uh, there's nothing. It's it's free to join. It's just a a group. I'm going to talk about some like non-local stuff in. So, all right, everyone. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Have a nice night.